The envelope had been in my pocket for three days waiting for the right moment to ask her. Tonight being Friday would seem to be my best chance because Dad would have his wages and would go out to the pub after tea, leaving me and Mum to bath Charlie, Jane and Tom. I would try to be especially helpful. But I must find the right moment. Friday night is always bath night for the youngest members of the family. I have to have showers at school after sports. Dad gets his shower at the pits and Ralph, who is ten, says that since he swims in the river that he doesn't need one and he always gets away with it. Anyway, his best friend lives on the council estate where they have a bathroom with hot and cold water and since he seems to spend more time there than at home, maybe he washes there. Boys don't seem to like washing very much anyway. Mum has to nearly tie him down when she wipes the flannel over in his face and knees before he goes to school. We carried the tin bath from where it hangs on the wall outside the kitchen into the living room and put it in front of the fire room. The living room is the only warm room in the house. Although we have a gas cooker in the kitchen, the coal-fired range in the living room provides heat for the room and also has an oven. The hobs on the top heat the kettle or the stew pot. Naturally it's the room where we do everything. I undress Jane who is six, although she likes to tell everyone that she's six and a half and will soon be seven, and then Charlie who is five, but he hasn't learned to count yet. Mum told Tom who is eight to get himself ready for his bath, but by the time she had carried the buckets of hot water from the copper in the kitchen to fill the bath, He'd only taken his jumper and shoes off. Mum adjusted the temperature of the water in the bath and sprinkled in the soda, leaving me to, me to deal with Jane and Charlie, while she took Tom into the kitchen, where she made him stand in the shallow stone sink and give him what she called a top and tail. I heard him yell as Mum pulled his string vest up over his ears as I lifted the other two into the bath. Normally Tom would have his bath after the two younger ones had finished theirs, but obviously this wasn't the night when Mum was going to have any messing about. I had to give the school an answer by Monday. Charlie's no trouble at bath time. I only have to soap him, and he giggles and laughs when I soaked his bum and his willy. Then he just smacks the water and splashes himself and everyone else all over. Jane just sits and tries to make patterns with the bubbles that float on the water. It's when I come to rinsing her hair that she screams and protests. I hope tonight that tonight I could get her to cooperate and not have Mum rushing in to take charge. I decided that I would just wet her hair to avoid the risk of any soap going into her eyes and hopefully avoid any tantrums. Mum came in with Tom dressed only in his shirt and his face looking like she had attacked it with the pumice stone as I was gently dribbling the water over Jane's head. I smiled at her and gave her arm just a little squeeze. Well, perhaps just a bit more than a little squeeze, and I think she understood. Mum sat Tom on the dining room chair and tore a strip of clean cloth from the bag that she keeps for bandages, smearing the germaline ointment onto it and wrapping it round a very sore-looking Gray's knee and told him to go to bed. We pushed the bath further back into the room and stood Jane and Charlie on the rag mat in front of the fire. Mum sat on a chair with Jane between her knees and dried her hair with a towel, then taking a vest from the airing rack, slipped it over her head and took her up the stairs to bed. Charlie just stood and pranced about, shaking his wet head and rubbing his body with his hands, so I hardly had to dry him at all, although we went through the motions. When I had put his vest on, I carried him up the stairs to the bedroom that we share with Ralph. We have three bedrooms. Mum and Dad have the largest front one and Jane sleeps with them in what was once her cot that Dad had altered although she often seems to finish up in their bed. Ralph and Charlie share a double bed in my room. 
Tom and Ralph used to share, but then nobody got any sleep. Ralph threw Tom out of bed one night and caused a deep gash in his head while I, when it hit the marble washstand. After that they were separated, with Tom being allowed to sleep on his own in the tiny back third bedroom, and Charlie shared the double bed with Ralph. Ralph tolerates Charlie, but he wriggles about, and if I'm awake I sometimes take him in with me when Ralph grumbles at him. All of the bedrooms are cold. Often in winter the window panes are frosted on the inside. We have stone hot water bottles wrapped in old blanket and Charlie wraps his arms around his and hugs it like, hugs it like it's a favourite animal. All of us take our underclothes and socks into bed with us so that we have something warm to put on in the morning. I left Charlie scrabbling about under the bedclothes and went downstairs intending to ask Mum if I could go. I helped her empty the bath and carry it outside. Mum collected all the children's clothes, examined the outer garment for tears and took the rest of the, uh, the rest to the kitchen where she put them in the copper for washing. We sat in front of the fire. Mum pushed the mushroom dolly into a sock, probably Tom's, and started to darn it. I took the envelope from the pocket of my school tunic. What you got there then? It's a letter from school. Let me see. I thought you had been looking a bit sheepish. Let me see it. Have you been getting into trouble? No, Mum, it's not that, and she snatched the envelope from me before I had time to explain. I watched her read, praying that she would say yes. Two and sixpence? Don't be daft. Where do you think we're going to get that sort of money to waste on a trip to the seaside? I ain't never been to the seaside in my life. I suppose I really knew that would be her answer, but I tried one last approach. Well, I think the whole of the class are going, and Henrietta says, Henrietta, <laughs> you'd be better not to associate with her. They aren't the same sort as us. She's my friend, and she's going, and she says she wants me to go too. I bet she does. Half a crown is nothing to that family. He works in a bank, and they've only got one child and the fact that they've let her have everything what she wants probably accounts for the way she is. I knew there was no point in arguing. I said good night and went to my room. Charlie asked me why I was crying. I said I wasn't. I lay awake, wondering how I could get the money and what excuse I would make to Henrietta if I couldn't go, since she seemed so keen that we should go together. I had watched Ralph come to bed. He didn't speak, assuming that I was asleep, I suppose. I watched him push Charlie to the side of the bed and occupy the warm spot that he had created. I watched as Charlie wriggled and lay on his tummy across the bed with one legging, leg hanging out and his outstretched arm resting on Ralph's chest, which Ralph allowed to stay there. I don't know what time it was when he came in. I saw him framed in the doorway, silhouetted by the light from the landing. I saw him gently ease Charlie back into the bed pulling his vest down to cover his bum and tuck the patchwork counterpane round him. A small amount of light filtered into the room from the open door. He came and sat on the edge of my bed. I could smell the strong carbolic soap that he always smelt of when coming in from work, mixed with the odours of tobacco and beer. He'd taken off his collar and tie and the gold stud glinted in the subdued light. His braces were off his shoulders and dangled beside his trousers that were held up with a broad leather belt. I could feel the warmth of his body as it touched mine. 
Mum has shown me the letter. I waited for him to say more, but he just sat there, and then he placed his large hand very softly on my shoulder. I went to Whitby when I was a boy. He was very quiet for a long time, his hand smoothly stroking my shoulder, looking at the sleeping boys and smiling as though lost in the memories of his youth. He took his hand from my shoulder and fumbled down into the deep pockets of his trousers. I heard the chink of coins. I've told you, Mum, that I've had a win on the dog, so don't you think no different? He closed the door as he left. The room was only lit by the light of the moon filtering through the curtains, but sufficient for me to see the half-crown on the bedside table.